We start today a short journey, just a couple of weeks through this series called The Art of Neighboring. And I want to talk with you a little bit about um, what I have learned from it and Pastor Becky and I think are important lessons for us as we begin to ask that question. The Art of Neighboring. I had a chance to begin to read a book uh, by, uh, by Jay Pathak and, and Dave Runyon of that exact title, The Art of Neighboring, and the subtitle is Building Genuine Relationships Right Outside Your Door. Uh, Dave Runyon specifically is an author, he's a pastor, a teacher, and a good neighbor. Uh, not that I don't think that Jay is also a good neighbor, but specifically, as I've listened to some of the uh, podcasts and conversations that Dave has offered, he's helped us to unpack what Jesus is getting at when he invites you and me to be neighbors, to love our neighbor as the text this morning that Carrie just read for us is all about. Jesus took all of the hundreds of laws of the Israelites, those laws that the people of the Jewish faith followed and still today follow, and summarized them in two ideas, two big ones upon which all the laws and prophets hang, and that is love God with everything, your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But the question is, how do we define that, specifically our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Well, that's a big question. So let me ask you another question. Do you know how to eat an elephant? Yes, you do. One bite at a time. Yes, it's an old adage. You start small, in other words, but with small bites. And that's what Pathak and Runyon suggest, that we start small with this idea of our neighbors. You see, sometimes the problem with loving our, loving our neighbor is that we generalize the idea, our understanding of who our neighbor is. In the commute to and from work, is it those people? Is it the people we meet at the grocery store? Is it those that we have as colleagues at work, our students? Uh, is it our, our friends, our, our physical neighbors? Is it the person sitting in front of you or behind you or beside you in church? And the answer is yes. Our neighbor is and can be everyone. The problem, they write, though, is that when we aim for everything, we hit nothing. So when we insist we're neighbors with everybody, often we end up being neighbors with nobody, he says. It can be the general idea that we're to be neighbors to everybody, that we're to love everybody. And let me tell you, that is true. Jesus doesn't invite us to simply love those that are select. However, the problem with that is if you're called to love everybody the same way, to do everything to everybody the same way all the time, you'll get tired you'll be worn out. It's, it's not possible. And so it's easier for us to say if we can't do it the same to everybody all the time, then we'll not worry about it for anybody or at least just, just to a small handful. But one of the keys in the art of neighboring is to focus, to focus not in generalities, but to focus specifically on who it is that we would love and to know that we can't do it all, but we can do some things. See, I love how John Wesley says that we should do all the good we can in all the ways we can and all the times we can to all the people that we can. He doesn't say do every good. He says do all the good you can. Don't love, necessarily think that you have to love everybody all the time, although if God gives you opportunity to do so, then do so. But love, how the old song go, love the one you're with. <laughs> We all need to get back to the basics of what Jesus commanded. Love God and love others. Everything else is secondary. But loving in specific ways. I don't know about you, but i got to tell you that I'm really excited about the November release of the movie A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Have you seen the previews about it? Are you aware of it? It's about, of course, Fred Rogers. It's about Mr. Rogers. He, Mr. Rogers will be played by Tom Hanks, another guy. I just love Tom Hanks, too. About the life of Fred Rogers, a.k.a. Mr. Rogers, in part because our world so desperately, in my estimation, needs the likes and love of Mr. Rogers. Yesterday, as we heard, 
the story of the mass shooting in El Paso, Texas at Walmart, which left 20 people dead, dozens other injured, and thousands forever changed. And then I didn't even know about it, but Becky, my wife, told me about it this morning of the shooting overnight in, uh, in Ohio at a, um, at a bar around 1 o'clock or so, seven, eight, nine people dead. They still don't know for sure. 20-plus folks injured, hundreds of lives changed. Unfortunately, this be, seems to be the news that we hear, if not daily, once a week. We need the likes and love of Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers taught me something about, well, he taught me a lot of things, but he taught me specifically about the scary things, like what we heard and read about or watched on television with these shootings that happen in the news. Fred Rogers said this, that when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. I remember those words specifically in the wake of 9-11 in 2001. That specifically was quoted and, and plastered all over the news. And it's something that we could hold on to. It's something real that we needed to find the helpers. So I want to ask you this question. Who are your helpers? Who have been the helpers in your life? I, I paused and I did this exercise in my own life and I thought about the people in my life who were helpers when I was a child or, or when I was in grade school or middle school and high school, when I was young, a young pastor early on in my ministry. Who are the helpers in my life and ministry now? I don't have time in this sermon today to go through each of those people and name them to you, but I can assure you that they're forever etched in my mind that they are the people who, who are my helpers, who were my helpers, and, and I'm sure you know them. And I, so I want to invite you, when you go home after church today, you're sitting on your deck or on the patio, and you get outside in the shade of the tree to enjoy this beautiful day God has given, I want to invite you to, to just pause and ask yourself that. Who have been the helpers in my life? And think about them. Maybe even write them down and, and write the attributes, the qualities of those people. And, and you'll probably find, as I discovered when I did this, that there were certain qualities and certain things about those people, the character of those folks and what they did and how they did it and, and why they did it that began to be common in my thinking who those helpers were. We all have them. Maybe you're a helper for others because that's important. That's the little things. That's how we're going to eat this elephant in life. And that's with those one little bites at a time. You see, I want to invite us to, to, to be those helpers in courageous ways, to, to, to have the courage to lean in to the, those awkward moments in life. And, and those helpers who, who helped me, they leaned into this awkward kid. And i got to tell you, there were awkward things about me, and there still are. Just ask Becky, either spouse Becky or pastor Becky. They can both tell you but we have to be willing to lean into those awkward places those secret places uh, that's what uh, uh, the authors of the book called the secret sauce of neighboring in real ways you see it's it, it's not really that awkward but it can be uncomfortable for a while especially if you're going to be real with your neighbors. And again, think literally, your neighbors. So they begin in the book, The Art of Neighboring. They say, don't think about it in those grand ways. Think literally about those people who are right around you. So I did. I, they said, take, take a, you know, the uh, tic-tac-toe board. You, you, you draw the lines. You have that tic-tac-toe board, and you're right in the center. And then, so there are eight squares around you. And think about those eight squares as being the neighbors that you have. And so I did. I thought about the three houses that are across the street, the three houses that are behind us, the, the one on each side, left and right. And then they say, write the names of those neighbors that you have in each of those squares. And so I tried. And you know, three years I've been living in the house that we live in on Deer Creek Road. And I could only write the names of one of those neighbors in those squares around my square in the middle. I confess that, but I also stand before you today and say that's going to change. 
And I want to challenge you to do the same thing. Think about your neighbor. Now, and if you live out in the country and you don't have neighbors or they're miles away, then think about those eight people that are closest to you at work or the eight people that you spend the most time in close proximity to here in church. Think about the person who's sitting right in front of you or behind you or beside you. Do you know their names? And let me tell you, if we lean into those mildly awkward moments, the, specifically the conversations, especially if that conversation is because you've been calling that person who's a neighbor at work or in this, in this church or in your neighborhood, bro, all the time, or dude, hey, dude, how's it going? How, how's it? And, but you don't know their name. It's going to be awkward. When I go and ring the bell of my next door neighbor that I've stood over the fence that separates our yards and talked to on more than three different occasions. I'm going to go to him and say, you know, look, this is embarrassing, but I don't know your name. And find out what that name is. I'm going to do that. And that's one of the first things about this art of neighboring, and it is to be humble. We have to humble ourselves. Hey, this, this is embarrassing but, but I don't know your name. Somebody who's sitting here in this church or somebody you've talked to that, that you've seen f- every Sunday or nearly for two, three years, maybe a decade, I, I want to challenge you. Maybe you'll go to them and say, you know, this is kind of embarrassing, but i got to say, I, I don't know your name. This is, I'm going to give you all a mulligan. If you play golf, you know, ask Fred Martinez. If you don't know who Fred is, then you should. So maybe you can introduce yourself to Fred. But Fred, uh, or Frank, not Fred, Frank Martinez. Fr- I am two for two. Praise the Lord. Frank stands at the back of the uh, sanctuary on Sunday mornings and greets folks. He's 92 years old. He plays golf every day at 5 a.m. I'm sorry, goes to the Y at 5, then goes out to the Air Force Base and plays uh, 18 holes at the golf course at 92. So he'd know what a mulligan is. A mulligan is a do-over. I today give all of you an opportunity to have a do-over. You all get a mulligan. So go to that person that you know you know, but you don't know their name, and get to know who they are. So, you know, this is embarrassing, but that's humbleness. And humbleness is one of the first steps in real relationships, in the art of neighboring. And so I want to encourage you that. Some of your neighbors, that you'll learn the, their names, but you'll find also that they don't want to be friends with you. They're too busy, much like I am a lot of times, and you are, and we all are, but we don't really want to admit that. They run from kids' activity to kids' activity to kids' activity to fast food on the way home to get in the garage. The door goes up, the door goes down. They go inside, they get homework done, they detox from the day, they go to bed, they get up in the morning, and they do it all over again. That's the pace of our lives so often. We don't have time to know our neighbors, but if we humble ourselves and try to do it, we can make a difference. We need to have a lot of grace for that because that's how our culture teaches us to live that rat race, but Christ calls us to slow down. That's, isn't that what Jesus did? He slowed down and he got to know people. He, he understood their names and their needs and their, uh, their hopes, and he, he touched them, and he prayed for them, and he healed them, and he walked with them, and he ate with them. Some of our neighbors are dying for connection, and we don't even know it. If you just make enough margin in your life, if you just live in a way that you are interruptible, then you can make space for others to connect with you. That's why I called today's sermon the interruptibles, or to be interruptible. See, I try to be interruptible. Pastor Becky does that. And what that, what that is, is whenever you come into my office, when I was in my previous appointment, Arnie Safe, one of the, the guys that was a member of the church there, he always said that he appreciated that about me, that I, I engaged in what he called the ministry of interruptions. And I know that you know about that, because most of the time when you visit me in my office, you walk in and one of the first things so many of you say is, I'm sorry to interrupt. I know you're busy. I don't want to bother you. Let me tell you, friends, if I don't want you to bother me and I'm busy, I'll close the door. But if my door's open, I invite the interruption. And I can tell you Pastor Becky does too because I've done it. I walk into her office all the time and interrupt her. and She's so gracious. The ministry of interruptions, when we allow our lives and the pace of it to stop and to recognize the person who's in front of us as a real person and get to know them. If you're actually going to connect with people, then you're going to have to live a life at a different pace than what the world teaches us. There are huge benefits to living in a way that we really love our neighbors in real ways. And the key to do that is in the small things. First, 
Take, take just a five seconds and have a conversation. How, hey, Rod, how's it going today? Steve, did you see the end of that Broncos game last night? Then it goes from there to asking something. Hey, hey I, I got to move something in my garage about 10 feet from one side to the other. and It's pretty heavy. I can't do it myself. Could you come help me? Ask your neighbor to, in, to be involved in that. Don't be the one who's Superman who wants to go over and do whatever you can for your neighbor and solve a problem for them. Go to them and ask them to do something for you because who among us doesn't like to feel needed? Who among us doesn't like to be a helper? And so if I as a neighbor am willing, and this is the second thing, to be vulnerable enough to go and say, hey, I can't do this on my own or I need some help, even if I don't really but I, but I go and ask anyway, that's important that we can be those who invite others into our lives and let them know that we need them. It's good to be needed. We need to be needed. See, I literally remember as a kid, my mom sent me next door to the Smiths, Roy and Sherry. See, isn't, isn't that something interesting? I can't tell you seven of the eight neighbors around me, but from my childhood, I, I can tell you every neighbor. Smiths were on this side. The, the uh, Williamses were just across the street. The Brandons were across the street here. The Barneys were over here. The Albrechts, Albrights, all, we got the Albrechts here. Albrights were just a, a block over. Uh, Mrs. Jones, it was really Mrs. Jones, <laughs> lived two houses over. Mrs. Ammons was next to her. I know that. I don't know my neighbors today. Mom sent me next door to the Smiths to borrow a cup of sugar. Sounds cliche, doesn't it? But we literally did. What if next time when you realize whatever it is that you need, if it's sugar or milk or flour for what you're baking or cooking, and you realize you don't have it, and you're going to get in the car and drive 20 minutes to Schnucks or to, or to Walmart or, or to Aldi and 20 minutes back, instead, take five minutes and walk next door and ask your neighbor if they have a cup of milk that you can borrow. I know it'll be weird, awkward, but you're vulnerable, and you begin to build some relationship, and we begin to have the communities that we all often lament not having anymore in those nostalgic conversations that we have that don't seem to exist anymore, and they don't because we don't take the opportunity to be vulnerable and to trust each other enough. Spouse Becky has often said also that, that if this is something that, that I can do, that I seem to do pretty well, and that is to, to go and be curious, to ask questions, to, to go to your neighbor and to say to them, hey, you know, if they're interested in gardening or, or, or sports or hunting or cars, and you go and you ask them about that. And Becky's right. It's true. I, I am curious. I, I like to know things about people. I ask a lot of questions. I am genuinely often curious to find out about other people. But even if I'm not really all that interested, I am inter interested enough in who the person is that I'll ask them about what they do. And that's the other thing then, and that is to be curious. To be curious and to know that when it comes to your neighbor, it will be difficult to be curious about what they're interested in when you're still calling them bro. But if you call him Steve, say, hey, Steve, I, I know I, I hear you saying that you, uh, you know, a lot of times in the fall you, you go hunting. And I got to tell you, I, I've never really been a hunter. In fact, I, I had never hunted. Now, my dad grew up hunting, but I didn't. And my, my dad didn't raise us to be hunters. But when I was in my previous appointment, there was a guy there who would always go uh, turkey hunting in the fall and so I one time said to him hey can I go turkey hunting with you and we went and he taught me and we sat and we sat and we sat and, and we sat and we were quiet and I fell asleep and we sat and I learned about turkey hunting and it was fun and 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 Tom taught me a lot and I learned a lot about Tom and we built relationships he became a neighbor and I've learned so much in life from asking other people questions and, and let's be honest who doesn't like to talk about something that they like and are interested in? What's happening outside your door? Who are your neighbors and what are they interested in? Ask them to, to tell you. Even if you know a lot about gardening, but you know they like to garden, ask them about gardening. Let them tell you how they do it. And finally, be patient in the smallness. It may take time. What I mean by this is, Jesus was really good about this. He would be patient enough to take time to see the overlooked. 
he noticed the invisible. He paid attention to the forgettable, and he cared about the disposable. He was one who could look in the eyes and see what others couldn't. And he would he listen with his ears and hear what others wouldn't. And you know, this is a long game. It can take time to build authenticity. Gather small and love deep is a phrase that they use in the book. But in our world today, we like to gather large. We always talk about the numbers. How big? Right? Even I get hung up in this sometimes, and Pastor Becky and we as your staff, we get hung up on the numbers. How big? It's all about the numbers. But this is what, what, what I want to help us to understand, though, that God calls us to the realness, not to, to the shallowness of the numbers, but to the authentic, authenticity of the depth. This is what is also referred to as the Starbucks model. Howard Schultz, former CEO of Starbucks, once was asked, can you get big by staying small? His answer was yes. That's why you can see so many Starbucks in one area. In fact, I remember we visited a city, I think it was Seattle one time, and there were literally three Starbucks on three of the four corners of an intersection. And the reason they do that and its intention is by their design because they want to have a community. It's not about the quantity they serve in a single store, a million hamburgers made. But it's about the quality of the relationships they build in those stores. And if they don't know all their customers by name as baristas, then they'll open another store so that they can get to know them and and create smaller crowds. In fact, in 2008... They closed 7,000 Starbucks stores temporarily so they could retrain the staff on how to make every single coffee product that they make fresh every time. They had nothing on standby. They make it once you get there and you have to wait for it and they call your name wrong each time. Well, maybe not every time, but they removed a po- yeah, they removed a popular breakfast sandwich from their menu because it was causing the stores to smell like burnt cheese when they made them and they it was detracting from the fresh aroma of their real product coffee i guess burnt cheese coffee wasn't appealing in his book onward how starbucks fought for its life without losing its soul schultz says quote we have created a relationship with our customers based on a very unique emotional relationship that goes beyond just being in a transactional business like a fast food company. Not unlike the English pubs in the UK, and if you've ever been there, you know what he's talking about. He says, Starbucks serves as a third space between home and work, which is an extension between people's lives and at a time where people can find a place where they find no more space to belong. They want to be that place. So I want to take a moment and say something about that. I had the privilege, and Heather, my wife Becky said, did you ask her beforehand? I didn't, so grace abounds, apologies ahead of time. I had the privilege of participating in Colonel Heather LeBue's retirement ceremony at Scott Air Force Base yesterday, oh, I'm sorry, on Friday, after 28 years of service as a JAG. Thank you. Yeah. And in that, I was intrigued by the way that Heather gathered together people from all across the years of her career and profession with whom she had made lifelong, authentic relationships with. That was powerful to see, Heather, I want to tell you. And further, I want to tell you, I learned from that. I had a chance afterward to go to lunch with their family and friends, and I got to know a lady by the name of Angela Angel. And Angela is a professional, a paralegal, retired Air Force. She worked with Heather for several years, and she now lives in Portland, and she loves to bake. And she made the cake for her son and her daughter-in-law at their wedding, and she showed me the picture of of the face on her daughter-in-law and son's faces when they first saw the cake when it was revealed at the wedding reception. And I know that, that Angela lived in Australia for a while until she moved back to the States, and then she bought her son's house so that they could move and close on a house that they wanted. And she lives in that house, but not all the time. And she rents that house through Airbnb, and you can stay in her house if you'd like. And Becky and I, when we go out there sometime, we're going to stay in her house. We're going to rent it, and I'm hoping because I know her, I'm going to rent it cheaply. (laughs) But do you see what I'm talking about? That was real. 
I mean, I got to know this person, and it just happened because I was curious, and I asked questions, and she was happy to show me the pictures, and she had hundreds of them on her phone of the cookies and the cakes that she's baked, and she went to this baking class, and she's really excited about it, and it was awesome. And that was real. That was the art of neighboring. And I learned that even yesterday, or Friday. And so I want to encourage you, when Jesus says, love God with all that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Don't just take that in the abstract. Take it in the real. Take it into, as to be the people that are living right next door to you or right across the street from you or sitting right in front of you or behind you today. And begin to take that step. Make an effort. I'm, I'm going to draw that cross or that uh, board on, on my refrigerator and put it on a piece of paper and stick it on my fridge for the tic-tac-toe board. And I, I'm going to write the one name of the couple that I know right next door. And then I'm going to begin to fill in all those other seven blanks. It's going to take some time, but I'll keep you updated as I do. And I hope you will too. Because friends, we, we sit here today and we can't fix the world but we can make a difference. And that difference starts in our neighborhood. Let's pray.